Good afternoon. I'm Mandy Cohen. I'm the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services for the state of North Carolina. It's good to be with you. With me today is Director Mike Sprayberry, Nicole Fox, and Karen Magoon are our American Sign Language interpreters. And working behind the scenes, as always, are our Spanish interpreters, Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. I'll start with a rundown of the numbers. As of this morning, there were 10,923 lab confirmed cases in 98 counties. 547 people are currently hospitalized. And sadly, there have been 399 deaths. So no graphs today, but we do have some new data news to share. Today's new feature is lab confirmed cases by zip code. We've been giving it out by county, but now we'll be releasing it by zip code. This will be up by the end of the day today. We're doing our best not to crash the site again, so bear with us as we get a lot of information up on our website. As with all data, this data also has its limitations. There will not be data shared for zip codes that have less than 500 people and less than five lab con confirmed cases. So no data for less than 500 people and less than la five lab confirmed cases. That's consistent with policy from the National Center for Health Statistics to help pe protect people from being identified. Remember, that doesn't mean there aren't people with COVID-19 in those zip codes. Um, we continue to hope to roll out new data as we balance our transparency, public health, and patient privacy work as we also work to respond to this crisis. We hope that new data will be helpful to everyone. Yesterday, we shared where we are on some of those key measures that we're looking at as we plan for easing restrictions. I'm pleased to see that we continue to do more testing, and we saw that yesterday. More than 5,300 tests were done yesterday, and the percent that were positive decreased to 7%. That's a great thing. As I said yesterday, we didn't get here by accident. I'm really, really proud to be a North Carolinian. Together, we've done what a lot of other states have struggled to do. We are putting ourselves in the best position possible for when we can ease those restrictions. And as we look forward to this month of May, that means moving forward, gra forward gradually and getting used to a new way of doing things. Remember, there are a lot of North Carolinians who are at higher risk of serious illness from COVID-19, and everything we continue to do collectively to slow the spread of the virus protects our friends and our neighbors. About 38% of adults under the age of 65 in North Carolina have at least one of the underlying health conditions that the CDC has named as high risk, 38%. So we're going to have to be smart to keep our families and our communities safe and do all the things that we can. That's gonna mean things like staying six feet apart from people when you leave your house, and if you can't say six feet apart, that means wearing a face covering, washing your hands for more than 20 seconds, or using hand sanitizer frequently is going to be important. You need to stay home if you're sick. And if you're older or at high risk of serious illness from COVID-19, still staying home as much as possible is going to continue to be important. As I look at the data, I remain optimistic that the trends will be stable enough to move us into phase one next week. If we stay home now, we can put ourselves on a successful path to begin easing those restrictions and move forward as planned. You can make a difference to protect your family and your neighbors. Let's keep looking out for one another and staying home to save lives. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Director Sprayberry for a few remarks and then we'll take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and good afternoon. Today is day 53 of the State Emergency Operations Center's COVID-19 response. We now have more than 2,010 National Guard soldiers and airmen supporting food bank and school feeding operations. Those men and women have been extremely busy. 
stocking, sorting, loading, and unloading, packing, and delivering food as they support school feeding and food banks in a wide variety of ways. Today, we're adding additional soldiers and airmen to the Bladen County School Feeding Program to help give its workers some much needed time off. We thank those Guard members for their very important service. You can also help make sure people are fed with a donation to a local school ba food bank. Visit feedingthecarolinas.org to find a food bank near you or to donate online. Our logistics and sourcing teams continue to purchase, receive, and distribute personal protective equipment and other supplies. Yesterday, we received shipments of gloves, masks, and N95 respirators. We also shipped out to 33 counties and two health care coalitions. We've spoken a bit about recovery over the last week. On that front, we've been notified by FEMA that North Carolina has been approved for the Crisis Counseling Program. This is for all the counties in North Carolina who intend to help people in recovering from the psychological effects of COVID-19 by providing community-based outreach and educational services. This program also helps disaster survivors in understanding their current situation, mitigating stress, reviewing recovery options, developing coping strategies, providing emotional support, and encouraging links with others who may help in their recovery process. Crisis counseling is the only program currently authorized for North Carolina under FEMA's Individual Assistance Program. We continue to work with FEMA and other federal partners on additional individual assistance programs. As she just mentioned, Secretary Cohen and the DHHS team are rolling out new data on lab-confirmed cases by zip code. And, as she also noted, there will be no data for zip codes that have less than 500 people and less than five lab-confirmed cases. This helps people from being identified, and that's a good thing. We appreciate her team working very hard to provide the public and the state emergency response team with more information to help us understand COVID-19 and inform all of our decisions as we move forward. Next week is Hurricane Preparedness Week. You will be hearing a lot more from me next week about that. But while you're home this weekend, it's a good time to check your family emergency kit and make sure it's ready for hurricane season. If you don't have a kit, Visit the website at readync.org to find out how to build one. Don't forget to include things like wipes, hand sanitizer, and face masks that will help keep you healthy during this pandemic. Talk with your family about your emergency plan. If you have to evacuate, where will you go? Make a plan so you don't have to rely on a busy shelter during the pandemic. Staying with family or friends or at a hotel may be better options. If you live inland, offer to let family or friends near the coast evacuate to your home. With the current pandemic, we are all going to have to think a little differently to stay safe this hurricane season. I thank you for your efforts to follow the governor's instructions to stay home, stay distance, and stop the spread. That's how we will all be able to ease restrictions, keep up the great work, and as always, don't forget to look out for your family, your friends, and your neighbors, and to call your loved ones daily. Guaranteed they'll appreciate it. With kindness and cooperation, we'll all get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. Thank you, Madam Secretary, and back to you for questions and answers. Terrific. Thank you, Director Sprayberry. We'll open up for questions. start with Chandler Morgan from WDTV. Hi, Director Cohen. This is Chandler Morgan from WBTV. Could you be more specific with how this zip code dashboard is going to work and where people can access it and at what time we should expect this? Thanks, Chandler. So in terms of the zip code data, it will be posted on our same uh, dashboard page at uh, dhhsnc.gov 
uh, slash coronavirus. So you can go check that out there. I hope to see that up in the next hour or so. They're just working to make sure they don't overwhelm the server with that. So check out our dashboard where you see all of our, our other numbers and you'll see it there. Thanks so much. Our next question is from Dewan Hovard with ABC 11. Hey, good afternoon to you, Dewan Hogard, WTVD. Uh, with something related to the budget, Dr. Cohen, I know that you were pretty clear with what you wanted in there previously. Do you have any thoughts on the compromise plan, or is that plan missing anything? Dewan, thanks for that question. And yes, earlier mentioned that there were some critical items around our public health response, um, around making sure we had uh, uh, funding for our rural and underserved communities for behavioral health. Um, and I think they're, I'm forgetting, oh, they're important on uh, nutrition and shelter activities. So the good news is, is I do see those included in the package that came together after the House and Senate have done uh, their negotiations. I don't think they're quite finished yet, or at least I haven't seen the uh, another update in the last hour. I know we were still working for some additional funding to some of our underserved communities, but but I feel uh, good about where folks have, have landed, um, including the priorities that we have articulated earlier in the week. Um, so we'll look forward to having that uh, funding go quickly out to our communities to help with uh, response to COVID-19. Thank you. Next question is from Steve Harrison with WFAE Radio in Charlotte. Yeah, Dr. Cohen, uh, thank you. I have a question about the charts uh, and the way they've been presented. The state has consistently plotted new infections and hospitalizations with a y-axis of like zero to 500 or zero to 600. And then uh, that's the way it is on the website today. But during yesterday's briefing, the hospitalizations were at zero to a thousand. It seemed to, that of course makes the, the line appear much flatter. Why did you guys change, uh, change the scale uh, to yesterday? That question and for being so detail oriented about our data, I, I will go back and look. I know, I know there are a couple different designers who do our, our work in terms of, of making those graphs. So it may have been because the hospitals popped over 500, but I'll, I'll go and ask. I, I think that was just a design uh, issue. I think the overall thing we want to, want to convey about hospitalizations, they're largely flat. And even when we have modulations of, of even you know, 50 to 100, that is largely flat in terms of the capacity of our overall healthcare system. So I think that's what we're trying to convey to folks is that we're feeling pretty comfortable that even with, with small fluctuations, that is largely flat when we're looking at what, what are our hospitals able to manage in terms of capacity. And as we've been talking for many weeks, that's really what we're after here, right, is making sure that we're slowing the spread of the virus so too many people don't get sick at the same time. And so our healthcare system can have the capacity it needs. So I'll go back on the design um, issue uh, there, but I think the overarching message is we are largely stable in terms of our hospitalizations, even with a small fluctuation. So it may have been, we, you know, we did pop over uh, 500 cases there, so they, that might have been the, the issue. But thanks for following our stuff so closely. Appreciate it. Next question is from Jonathan Alexander with the News and Observer. Hi, Dr. Cohen. This is Jonathan Alexander with the News and Observer. Um, if uh, the drug passes through trials, uh, what will North Carolina hospitals need to do to have uh, enough rim divisor on hand to treat patients with COVID-19? And does the state have the capability to manufacture or acquire enough of the drug to treat hospitalized patients for 12 months? Thanks, Jonathan. I missed the beginning, but I think you were talking about remdesivir. Is that what you're referring to? And making sure that we had enough on hand, just to clarify. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yes. So, thank you for, for that. That is a medication that now has shown some promising effects in some of our, our sickest folks. Um, obviously, 
there are a lot of folks across the country and across the, uh, the world who have been greatly impacted by COVID-19. So the supply chain on that medication is an issue. We're working directly with that manufacturer um, to understand what are the, the ways in which we can get the, the right amount of supply here. I'll make sure our team follows up on exactly where we are in terms of supply here in North Carolina, because I don't, I don't know the specifics, but we'll get back to you, Jonathan, thanks. Next question is from Ken Smith at WRAL TV. Dr. Cohen, Ken Smith with WRAL TV. Thanks for taking my call today. Um, getting back to the, the big news concerning the, um, the uh, zip code information, uh, what are yeah. the implications of that? Because up until now, it was just released by county. Um, how does this help the, the information moving forward in terms of disseminating to people so they can have all the information in the interest of transparency? Ken, um, I don't know that there's a large difference here. I, I think, again, we're just trying to share as much information so folks feel like we are being transparent. Um, you know, I think many of us here in North Carolina very much identify with the county we lived in, which is why we share the information by county. It's how our local health departments uh, uh, do their work. Um, so there were some other states who were releasing this information by zip code, and so we were able to sort of clean up the data, so we released it by zip code. And again, just another way for folks to visualize this. Um, I, I would uh, say that they're, this, my, my researchers, if they were sitting here, would want me to share that zip code uh, level data does have a ton of variation and uh, uh, challenges with the data itself. So we will tend to use county level uh, data when we are looking at, 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 um, uh, at some of our, um, of, of our indicators. So, so, but again, just wanted to have more information out there for folks to, uh, to take a look at. Next question is from Cole Del Charco with North Carolina Public Radio. Thanks for taking my question. I, I wanted to get a little more specific about um, the end of next week with the stay at home order, you know, potentially ending or, or being amended. Are there any more discussions that y'all have had in terms of having different regions of the state open at different times? I know you've talked about how you don't want that to be at the county level. Yes, thanks for the question about as we think forward to how do we ease restrictions? And uh, yes, we've talked about how at the county level it is really hard given um, the fact that folks live in one county, work in another, shop in a third. Um, we've definitely heard from our business community about the confusion that even having some municipalities within a county having different uh, approaches to things. So what we've been trying to continue to do is think about how can we approach this at, at, a, at a state level and create a, a floor for how we're approaching this. I think it simplifies the message um, in a confusing time. I think it's, it's important for us to have clear uh, expectations and guidance as we move forward. So right, as of right now, we're gonna be mo moving forward um, with a statewide approach to easing restrictions. We have said that we may need to take a regional approach and they, that might be as we move through phases, it may be that certain regions can't move as fast as others. I think we don't know that yet. I think we'll have to continue to look at our data and understand how things are impacting our state. Um, certainly, as we, we see the, the seasons progress, we know that, that there will be folks who will visit the, the eastern part of our state in a different way. How will that impact virus and virus spread? All those things are, are things we're going to want to continue to look at as we think about a regional approach and could that be appropriate. But at least for now, as we think about easing restrictions, we're going to be doing that at a statewide level uh, for, for next week. Thank you. Our next question is from Alexis Bell with Spectrum News. Hi, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Hey, yes, this is Alexis with Spectrum News. I just had some questions about further clarification on the Community Tracing collab Collaborative. Um, do you all have more details on like when those hirings will start and um, an estimate on how many people you all would need for the state? I know you're adding 250. And last question is, is there a salary range for these positions? 
Alexis, thanks for those questions. Um, about our contact tracing, as you know, these are um, a workforce that we are going to want to deploy in addition to the workforce we already have in our local health departments. And in fact, training has already begun for our local health departments as we get uh, uh, going with this work on how to integrate further uh, a as we go forward and ramp up activities. So our partnership with Community Care of North Carolina uh, was announced earlier this week. On that day, they put up pages already for hiring. We know we've had over a thousand folks in the first 24 hours submit uh, an interest to be hired. We know we're also working with partners from around the state to want to make sure that we are getting folks from communities that we ultimately will be serving, right? These are gonna be people calling folks at their home and sometimes even going in person um, if necessary. We're gonna try to stay on the phone as much as possible to keep social, uh, social distance. But we want folks who come from the community because we want them to understand uh, the community that they're going to be interacting with. So partnership with our local community is going to be really important as we think about hiring. And we want to also focus that hiring on, on folks that have already been impacted by COVID-19 and might be out of work because of that. Uh, so that work uh, to recruit is already underway. I know our goal is to have 250 new folks both hired and trained and be ready to deploy by the end of May. I think we'll probably be halfway there by middle of May. I think we'll do it in two cohorts um, in order to get all the training done and in some small group sessions. So think work's underway for that. And if you are interested in being part of that team, there are two different kinds of positions. There are um, our, our, our public health uh, fo folks that are gonna do the, tr the tracing. And then there are some supervisor work. So there are different salary ranges um, and qualifications for each of those positions, but you can go see that on Community Care of North Carolina. Thanks for that. And our final question today is from Travis Fain with WRAL. Yeah, thank you. Travis Fain, WRAL, with a question for Director Sprayberry. I know you guys have a team vetting all sorts of offers of PPE and tests and whatnot from vendors. And I'm wondering how much or are you seeing any attempts at profiteering or organizations that appear to be pretty fly by night? That, thank you for that question, Travis. And so, as you know, we have been vetting uh, vendors for several weeks now, and we have seen some vendors that, um, that may not be as um, – the type of vendors that we would want to do business with. And so um, we're going through all those uh, vendors. We're making sure that, um, A, that they are um, able to do uh, business in the state of North Carolina, that they haven't been uh, debarred by the federal government or by the state of North Carolina. And so we, we take them through several gates to get to a point to where they're fully vetted. And then at that point, the next thing that we do is we have spec sheets for all the equipment that have been developed by public health industrial hygienists. And then our uh, sourcers take those spec sheets and make sure that the equipment and, and uh, supplies meet those specifications. And then once they get through that, uh, we actually have our industrial hygienists take a look at a piece of that equipment before we make any purchases. Once a purchase is made and it's delivered to one of our warehouses, again, we have an industrial hygienist to take a look to see if what we have ordered is uh, what we actually have received. And if it's not what we received, then we will uh, ship it back to the, um, at their cost to the vendor and we won't accept it. Because we have such a stringent vetting process, we haven't had a whole lot of uh, issues with uh, the types of supplies and equipment that we're receiving. So it's been working out pretty well. And we set that up kind of at the very beginning to make sure that we wouldn't have that issue. Thank you for the question. Great. Thanks, Travis, for that. And I'll just wrap us up here. 
thanking everyone again. It's been another incredibly busy week. Um, I'm sure that will continue into next week as we uh, continue to look at our trends, focus on uh, increasing our testing efforts, working on hiring up our new tracers to join our local health departments. Um, and then we, we look forward to talking more about how we uh, start to ease restrictions here in North Carolina. And we, we continue to protect each other, protect our friends and our neighbors neighbors as we move through forward through the month of May. All right. Thank you. Thanks for staying home to save lives.